We're completing our sermon series on habits. Today is the habit of serving. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3. So yesterday, Pastor Gary was on for a wedding at our church. Friday morning, he texted and said he's positive for COVID and can't do the wedding. So he asked if I would do it. So good thing he's very organized. He had the whole rehearsal planned out, everything, all the details were there. The sermon, the, the, the sermon was all typed out. I just filled in. I jumped in, and I read through the sermon. I tweaked it a bit, added a joke, and uh, it went well. I just filled in. That's kind of like what a servant does. A servant just jumps in and fills in. Uh, not the person to get the glory. There is no credit to that person. They simply just filled in. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 1, verses 1 to 9. <clears throat> but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants, through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. We need to jump back a bit or step back a bit to get a context of where this fits into the context. So Paul established the church in Corinth we can read about it in Acts chapter 18. He was there for about a year and a half. Five years later, approximately, he writes this letter to Corinth. There were many, many issues that were uh, conflicting in the church. They had divisions. They had sexual immorality. They were suing each other. At the Lord's table, they were getting drunk. And so Paul writes this letter to Corinth to deal with all these issues. So the first four chapters primarily deal with divisions in the church. And so our text is from this passage. So we need to fit it into the passage. So what were the divisions about? What was the church fighting over? What do churches fight over today? You can check online. You can find all sorts of humorous things about what churches have fought over in the past. Uh, I heard of a pastor who said in seminary they had an actual fist fight over the doctrine of election. Does God elect some and choose others and choose not? And so two guys in seminary actually had a fist fight over that issue. Some churches fight over do we have pews in the sanctuary? Do we have chairs in the sanctuary? It can get very heated. One church argued over both the length of the worship pastor's beard. One church argued about, do we call it a potluck or do we call it a pot blessing? Don't call it a potluck, call it a pot blessing. You can have all sorts of divisions in the church. We are not exempt. As long as you are a human being and have an opinion and you come to church, there is cause for division. So Paul deals with this division. What was the division about in Corinth? They were following different leaders. One said, I follow Paul. One said, I follow Apollos. One said, I follow Peter. And then some said, well, we follow Jesus. And so the division was not who they followed. 
the message was the same. Whether it came from Paul or Jesus or Peter, the message was the same. They were arguing about, actually, they were elevating themselves. They were, they were putting themselves on the platform and saying, well, I'm of Jesus, implying the rest of you aren't. And that's where divisions came from. Paul is going to address this issue. How do you address an issue in the church where there's divisions? Very graciously. Let's learn a lesson from Paul. Let's go back to chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I've got the text on the screen. If you don't have uh, a device, you'll have to listen. But for the meantime, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, start at verse 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, call to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. First off, the church is sanctified in Christ Jesus. I'm going to address you and all these issues. I just want to remind you who you are. You are sanctified. You are holy. You belong to Jesus. I want you to know that. Together. Saints, together. We are in this together. This is not an individual uh, one-upmanship. You belong to Christ. We're in this together. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he thanks God for what God has done in the lives of these people. Ten times in the first ten verses, we hear the phrase Christ Jesus. Ten times Paul mentions Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus. This is his church. You belong to Jesus. We need to get that straight. And then let's move on to divisions and why I'm writing this letter to you. Verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, brothers and sisters, we're in this together. I urge you, all of you, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarreling, that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? The answer, obviously, is no. There are divisions in the church. The divisions, uh, the word actually means, if it's directly translated from the Greek, schisms. There was a tear. There were divisions. There was a tear in the church. And so Paul is urging and pleading that the tear be mended. Verse 10, that you be united. The word elsewhere is translated re restore. It's used of restoring uh, broken nets. When, when a fishing net was torn, it needed to be mended. If, if, a, if a doctor were to use that term, they would use a, uh, a joint that was out of joint. That, that joint needed to be restored, put back in place again. So Paul is asking that these divisions, this tear in the church, be mended, be brought back together. There's a tear here, and we need to fix it. How do you fix a tear in the church? Let's go back to verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, we're in this together, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our authority. That's our unity. That's where we have Unity. When we peel away from Jesus and I say, I want my way. Look at me. I want to be elevated. Divisions will start. There's quarreling. Verse 11 talks about quarreling. And chapter 3 talks about quarreling. Did you know that quarreling is an act of the flesh? An act of the sinful nature. When there are quarrels in the church, there's evidence of I'm living out my sinful nature. Paul needs to address this in the name of Jesus. 
We need to come back to him. I so appreciated the songs that we sang this morning. We're so much about the cross, about I am yours, about Jesus paid it all. We need to focus on Jesus, and as we do that, and less of me, divisions will become uh, minimized. So we see that the divisions were, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, who they were choosing, and therefore they were saying, I am elevated, I am important, I am spiritual, and you are not because of who I choose to follow. And Paul says, you are all wrong. It doesn't matter who you choose, your method of your choosing is wrong, therefore you are wrong. They were saying, I am spiritual, but Paul is saying, you are carnal. You're living out your flesh. You need to live in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, there will be unity, there will be love, there will be an evidence of the Holy Spirit at work in the life of the church. So, with this divisions in place, trying to break apart the I am Paul, I am Apollos, that's not the focus. Don't focus on who you're, who you're following. Focus on Jesus. Now, chapter 3 says again, I could not address to you as spiritual, but as people of the flesh. So when Paul came to them five years ago, they were infants in Christ. They got saved. They were babes. They were new to the faith. Of course, they're going to live out in the flesh. They, they will look like they're in the flesh because they're babes in Christ, of course. Five years later, they should be walking in the Spirit, or at least more. But Paul says, you are still in the flesh. Verse 3, I could, uh, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? So, now he gets to who is Paul? Who is Apollos? He's tried to deal with the divisions. Now he's trying to say, don't elevate me. Don't elevate Apollos. Don't put us on a pedestal. Put Jesus on the pedestal. We are just simply servants. Don't elevate us. So here's where we get to the habit of serving. What can we learn from the Apostle Paul and his attitude, and how does it apply to us today? I want us to ask and answer three questions. Why should I serve? How should I serve? And who should I serve? Verse 1, or sorry, verse 5, the first one, why should I serve? Chapter 3, 1 Corinthians, verse 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed. What is Apollos? It doesn't say who. It says what. It refers to their function. What do you do? Suppose Paul gets to Corinth. He's uh, mingling with a bunch of men trying to make small talk. And of course, the first thing that comes up is, what do you do? One guy says, I'm an architect. One guy says, I'm a philosopher. One guy says, I'm a farmer. And they look to Paul and say, what do you do? I'm a servant. <coughs> oh, well, who's your master? The Lord Jesus Christ. Why should I serve? Because you are a servant. Paul uses three different words to convey the message of what a servant is. Uh, let's read chapter 4, verse 1. This is how you should regard us, as servants of Christ and as stewards of the mysteries of God. So that word servant there is different than the word servant used here. And yet, when Paul begins to write a letter, like Romans, often he says, Paul, a servant of Christ. That's a different word. So when Paul introduces himself as a servant, when he begins the letter, like Romans, it's a bond servant. It's maybe more correctly translated as a slave. I am the property of my owner. 
I do not belong to my own. I'm a permanent property of my owner. That's a slave. And that's what Paul says he is. In this passage, it's the word that we get our English word deacon from. It's more of a servant or an attendant, like a gas attendant. When you fill up at the pump, hopefully if he's a, or he or she is a good gas attendant, they will clean your windshield, ask if you want your oil checked, and fill in your gas. They're there to serve you. If you go to a, a restaurant, you've got a waiter or a waitress, they will get you your drink, they'll bring your meal, ask if everything is okay, do you need anything else? They're there to serve you. Paul says, I am a servant of Jesus. I'm here to serve Jesus. Jesus, what do you want me to do today? The third definition, it's an, another Greek word, chapter 4, verse 1, where he says, I am a servant of Christ. It's an under rower. In those days, they had ships, and the people at the bottom of the ship were the rowers. They would keep the ship going. The top had the commander or the, the captain. The bottom of the ship was where the under rower was. Paul says, I'm an under rower. I'm at the bottom of the ship. My captain is Jesus. Paul knows very, very well who he is and what he does. I am a servant. Why should you serve? Because you are a servant. And that's what servants do. Second lesson we can learn from Paul. Why should you serve? You will receive a reward. Chapter 3, verse 8. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. We will receive our wages, we will receive a reward when we meet Jesus. Later on in the chapter, he's talking about the building of the foundation. Uh, likely, Paul is teaching, he, he is instructing about, he was a, a teacher, he was the one who brought the Corinthians, the, the gospel, the foundation was Jesus Christ, and somebody else will come after him and build on that foundation. If they build on that foundation with wood, hay, or stubble, if their teaching is in line with what the foundation was, Jesus Christ, they will burn up. That teaching, or whatever you build on the foundation, will be burned up. So chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. When the day comes, we will receive a reward if you have been faithful. <coughs> Many of us know chapter uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, where it talks about we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and receive uh, what we have done, whether good or evil. We will receive a reward. We will meet Jesus, and on that day, he will give you pay or reward for what you have done. When I was a teenager... A bunch of teenagers were asked to work on a local farmer's cornfield. He wanted the, the, the fields to be weeded. I'm a teenager. Uh, don't care too much about work. I half worked, half played. So I remember telling my friend, hey, look at me, how, I can, how fast I can weed. And I'm half running and weeding at the same time. While the farmer either was watching me or heard about my performance. And so when my brother and I got paid, his paycheck was bigger than mine. And I knew why. There will be a day when you will meet Jesus face to face, and if you were a faithful servant and did your job, you will be rewarded. If not, you will not be rewarded. It will be very evident on that day. So why should you and I serve? Because 
you will receive a reward. Third, one last point as to why I should serve. Getting back to our text, chapter 3, verse 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servant, through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. Servant, through whom you believed. God used Paul and Apollos and the other teachers, and he worked through them so that the Corinthians would believe. Paul was just a channel. That word through actually just means channel. Paul was the channel that God used to bring the gospel to Corinth. Channels only, blessed master, but with all thy wondrous power, working through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. If you view yourself as a channel, As a servant, God can use you. God is looking for channels that he can use. Why should I serve? Because you are a servant, you will receive a reward, and God will use channel, use servants. So we've asked and answered the question, why should I serve? Let's ask the second question, how should I serve? How should I serve? Chapter 3, verse 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. How should I serve? Together. With others. This is not a one-man show. You're not in this together. You're not in this by yourself. You're not here to promote uh, your name, toot your horn. God has designed the body to work together. Paul watered. Uh, Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. Again, we see in chapter 3, verse 8, he who plants and he who waters are one. One. The body is one, right? Christ is the head. The body is one. We are in this together. How should I serve Jesus? Together. For our nativity that we had back in December, it took about 40 volunteers to make the nativity a success. It takes volunteers. We're looking for Connect teachers. So far, I believe we have around 20, which is excellent but we need a team of people who will help teach because we need people who will work together to accomplish uh, the common goal. We had VBS in the summer. How many volunteers did it take? 40? We need to work together as servants, not to promote my name, not to toot my horn, but we're in this together. How should I serve together? with other people. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 12 says, For just as a body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body. We see that again in verse 8 where Paul says, He who plants and he who waters are one. <clears throat> How should I serve? Together. We need each other. Let's work together. Let's be servants together. Another point that we can serve together, serve humbly. (coughs) Serve together with others and serve humbly. Verse 7. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants nor he who waters is anything. That's a little humbling to hear that for the Word of God to say, you're nothing. Only he who makes it grow is actually of value. You don't have a whole lot of significance, but God can still use you. Don't 
don't come in there and try, try to find a name for yourself, to try to find your self-worth or your self-esteem. Come in there as a lowly servant because that's who you are. He who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Twice in this passage, verse 6, but God gives the growth. Verse 7, but only God gives the growth. We can't make uh, a heart change. We can't make people get saved. We can plant. We can water. We can serve. But the results are up to God. What God does with it, that's up to him. When Peter was asked by Jesus to put out the nets for a catch, they just come back from all night of fishing. They were tired. And Jesus says, Put out, your night, put out your nets for a catch. Well, Master, we've been fishing all night, haven't caught anything. But because you say so, we will. They threw the nets out, and a huge, huge net full of fish came in. Who brought the fish in? Jesus did. Who cast the net? Peter did. God is just looking for servants who will plant, or sow, or throw out the net. And whatever comes in, that's up to him. The results are up to him. He just wants us to serve humbly. Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 36. I love this passage. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Why should I, how should I serve? How should I serve? Together and humbly. Serve in such a way so that God gets the glory and I'm just a, a, a simple servant doing my job. And lastly, who should I serve? Well, we know from Paul, he was a servant of Jesus Christ. Paul served God. Verse 9, we are God's fellow workers. That word fellow workers or God's fellow workers could mean that Paul and Apollos and the others are, are working together. We're working for God and we are fellow workers. We're working together. That could possibly be a meaning. It's more likely to mean that we are working with God. We are God's fellow workers, working with God. Did you ever have a class uh, assignment in school, a group project where you were assigned a group and there's one person who did all the work and you still got the A? Those are the teams you want to be on. We are God's fellow workers. We work with God. He will do all the work. <laughs> he will get the glory and we get to be a part of it. We get to be fellow workers. We're on the same team as God. What a privilege. He does the work, he gets the glory, but I'm on his team. In uh, Revelation, chapter 22, the end of all things are, are done, and uh, we're in heaven, we're with Jesus, we're worshiping him and serving him, and what are we? Who are we? Revelation, chapter 22, verse 3 says, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. We are servants here on earth today, and for all eternity, we will always be servants of God, serving God. Who should I serve? Well, we should serve God. And we should serve God's people. Verse 9 you are God's field, God's building. God sent Paul to Corinth 
because they were the field. Paul was the servant, he was the worker, and Paul was sent by God to work in the field, to build the building. You are the field, I'm coming, I'm coming to, to serve you, I'm coming to uh, minister to you, but I'm working for God. Who should I serve? God and God's people. Did you know that in Ephesians chapter 4, the purpose of the church, the purpose of the, the equipping of the saints is to teach us to serve one another. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 reads, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the work of serving, for building up the body of Christ. Paul had a mission. His mission in mind was to serve God together to build up his church. We see from the book of Corinth that there was a very individualistic attitude. Uh, a me, myself, and I attitude. You can't serve people. You can't have a serving attitude and be individualistic. By serving others, by serving God, you, you nullify, you quench yourself. There were divisions in the church. When we get together and serve Jesus, there's no place for divisions. By serving Jesus, by serving one another, we bring glory to Christ, our King, and put away individual attitudes, we put away divisions, and lift up the name of Jesus. Let's close with a word of prayer. And we'll call up the worship team to close off with that song once again. Father, we are so privileged to be called your servants. Yet we recognize that we have this flesh, we have this desire to be promoted, to be elevated, to be recognized. But you see our heart. And we invite you to humble us, to love one another, to humbly serve Jesus by serving people, that you can bring unity and love in such a way that is only evidence of you at work, that we would just willingly and joyfully serve you together with people who call their Lord you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.